I want the rest of you to hold my breath and hope he doesn't call on me. It's a good man. Let's give Pastor Walt for it. church on the street. <laughs> three engineers and three accountants are traveling by train to a conference. At the station, the three accountants each buy tickets and watch as the three engineers buy only one single ticket. How are three people going to travel on only one ticket, asks an accountant. Watch and you'll see, answered an engineer, and all of them board the train. The accountants take their respective seats, but all three engineers cram into a restroom and close the door behind them. Shortly after the train has departed, the conductor comes around collecting tickets. He knocks on the door of the restroom door and says, Ticket, please! The door opens just a crack, and a single arm emerges with a ticket in hand. The conductor takes it and moves on. The accountants saw this and agreed. This is a pretty clever idea. So, after the conference, the accountants decide to copy the engineers on the return trip and save some money. When they get to the station, they buy a single ticket for the, round, for the return trip. To their astonishment, the engineers don't buy a ticket at all. How are you guys going to travel without a ticket, says one perplexed accountant. Watch, and we'll show you. When they board the train, the three accountants cram into a restroom and the three engineers cram into another one nearby. The train departs shortly afterwards. One of the engineers leaves his restroom door open just a little bit, walks over to the rest. One of the engineers leaves his restroom, walks over to the restroom where the accountants are hiding. He knocks on the door and says, Ticket, please. <laughs> All right, tomorrow on Friday night, we're going to be showing um, God is Not Dead Part 2. Let's watch the trailer. We'll see what we've got in store for you. In this day and age, people seem to forget that the most basic human right of all is the right to believe. No prayers, no moments of silence. Nothing. Think of the other children out there who are subjected to their repressive belief system. If we sit by and do nothing, the pressure that we're feeling today will mean persecution tomorrow. We're at war. What makes nonviolence so radical is this unwavering commitment to a nonviolent approach. Isn't that sort of like what Jesus meant when he said that we should love our enemies? Yes. You have heard it said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. One of your students sent a text to their parents. Did this happen? If you're asking whether I responded to a student's question, yes. And your answer incorporated the words of Jesus. What were you thinking, Grace? The Thalys are asking that you be fired, plus revocation of your teaching certificate. How do we make this go away and not get blood on our hands? We let the AC on you do it. We're going to prove once and for all that God is dead. Nor in the matter of Thorley versus Wesley. Mr. Kane will insist faith isn't on trial here. But that is exactly what is on trial. You're looking to prove that Jesus Christ existed? Oh, that's ridiculous. I hate what people like your clients stand for and what they're doing to our society. You're under arrest. These people, they're looking to destroy you. Everyone's telling me to stay out of it. What is your heart telling you to do? I would rather stand with God and be judged by the world than stand with the world and be judged by God. I am not going to be afraid to say the name Jesus. Because I have nothing but contempt 
for the proceedings. God's not dead, he's surely alive. He's living on the inside. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just thank you, God, for the body of Christ. We thank you especially for this little family here. We thank you, Lord, that we've got a Father that loves us and corrects us. We thank you, Lord, that we can encourage one another. And Lord, I just thank you for the promise of the Holy Spirit to anoint your living word because God is the bread we live on. Anoint us tonight, O God, we pray. Pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. Open up your Bibles to Psalms 27. We're in the midst of the Psalms. Psalms, we can tell by looking, it was written by David, and I think that we need to refresh our memory that David spent almost 20 years running from Saul, really, just running to save his own life. He was anointed as a youngster, as a shepherd boy, that he was to be king, but the Lord put him through a school of hard knocks, to say the least, to mature that man, to become the king that he was to become. And the Saul was just, uh, well, he was insane as far as I'm concerned. He was turned over and he acted like a lunatic and he was so paranoid. And just to give you a little taste of probably what drove uh, uh, David to write this particular psalm, back in 1 Samuel 23, you don't have to turn there, you can if you want, um, it kind of sets the stage where in 22, uh, David has, has fled and he's gathered up a group of men and I think in modern day terms, he would like going down to the, to the uh, zone down by Cass and probably picked up his men because that's who they were. They were people who were, you know, at outs with the law and so forth. And those were David's men. But Saul had a huge army and he was out to kill him. And, and there was a group of guys that ratted on him. They wanted to score points with Saul. And so the Ziphites let them know where David was. And so he and his men are out to get him. And in chapter 23 of 1 Samuel, we pick up the story at verse 26. Well, actually the end of 25. And when Saul heard that, where he was, he pursued David in the wilderness of Maon. Or Maon, Maon. Then Saul went on one side of the mountain. Picture this. Saul and all of his men are on one side of the mountain, and David and his men are on the other side of the mountain. So David made haste to get away from Saul, for Saul and his men were encircling David and his men to take them. That close. Look what happens. God intervenes. But a messenger came to Saul, saying, Hurry and come, for the Philistines have invaded the land. Therefore Saul returned from pursuing David and went against the Philistines, so they called the place called the Rock of Escape. Then David went up from there and dwelt in a stronghold in Engedi. In other words, it was just the beginning. So it was constantly, constantly on him. And you know the beauty of all this is that David wrote these songs during all this stressful time. And that's the time when he drew the closest to the Lord. Remember after he becomes king? Remember those, those words where it says, and in the spring when kings go off to war, and David didn't go off to war. And you know what happened? You know, he committed that terrible crime of, with Bathsheba and then murdered her husband, and it was a downward spiral. I mean, he fought, he, he held his own, but he had bad consequences. But so it seems like when we're under pressure... It seems like when we really seek God, and this is what God has revealed in Holy Scripture here of, of what David has gone through, and it's so helpful to us. So let's take a look at Psalms uh, 27, but let's listen to it first. This is King James Version. 
The Lord is the strength of my life. 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 The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked came against me to eat up my flesh, my enemies and foes, they stumbled and fell. Though an army may encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war may rise against me, in this I will be confident. One thing I have desired of the Lord, that will I seek that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord, and to inquire in his temple. For in the time of trouble he shall hide me in his pavilion, in the secret place of his tabernacle he shall hide me, he shall set me high upon a rock. And now my head shall be lifted up above my enemies all around me. Therefore I will offer sacrifices of joy in his tabernacle. I will sing, yes, I will sing praises to the Lord. Hear, O Lord, when I cry with my voice, have mercy also upon me and answer me. When you said, Seek my face, my heart said to you, Your face, Lord, I will seek. Do not hide your face from me. Do not turn your servant away in anger. You have been my help. Do not leave me, nor forsake me, O God of my salvation. When my father and my mother forsake me, then the Lord will take care of me. Teach me your way, O Lord. Lead me in a smooth path because of my enemies. Do not deliver me to the will of my adversaries, for false witnesses have risen against me, and such as breathe out violence. I would have lost heart unless I had believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait on the Lord, be of good courage, and he shall strengthen your heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. All right. Notice in the very beginning, he centers on God. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength, or some of your Bibles say, the stronghold of my salvation. Of whom shall I be afraid? You know, many times when people come up to me and ask me to pray for them or agree in pray for prayer for someone else, I often say these words, let's lay aside our thoughts about ourselves. Yeah. Lord, we're going to lay aside our thoughts about ourselves. We're going to lay aside our thoughts about our problem, whatever the situation is. <coughs> we're not going to, we're not going to think about what we're coming to you in prayer for. We're going to lay all that aside, and we're going to think about you. Amen. Think about you. We get our eyes off of ourselves, off of our problems, and get them up there. There's our source, right? And that's exactly what David does. He says, the Lord is what? My light and my salvation. Light, darkness, darkness, confusion, chaos, devilish, right? And there you have God's bright light shining, piercing the darkness, guiding, giving clarity, order, understanding, refreshing, isn't it? God is our light. You know, and one of your songs you said, uh, "No shadow you won't light up." Same remember, "No shadow you won't light up." Yeah. 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 Exactly. That's that light, that light that He's going to be for us. And um, as we go on, He says, "He is the light of our salvation." You know, um, there's a Psalm, Psalms 36, 9. Uh, it begins a little few verses before that. It says, How priceless is your unfailing love. Both high and low take refuge in the shadow of your wings. They feast on the abundance of your household and drink from the rivers of your delight. For in you is the fountain of life. And here it comes. And in your light we see light. In his light, we see light. When we're down here in the muck and the mire and the darkness and the woes, some of our songs that we sing, we like, but I was mentioned to Hillary, we really belt it out when it really talks about how dark it is and how terrible it is and how we're trying to get this and how I'm starting to stifle my, stifle my anger. And boy, we can really get into that. So what David does. I mean, he's, he's in a situation probably, he doesn't know who's coming around the corner. And what does he say? The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? 
The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? So on number one, center on the Lord. Some of you come down here and you pour out you again and again. It's petition. God hears. We already keep on asking. But I challenge you to say, Lord, you're the one that seek out the lost. You're the one that does. You're the one that heals. You're my, you're this. Amen. Then present your petition. Amen? Amen. 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 A lot of power behind that. That's what he did. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The strength, the stronghold. You know, it's like a refuge. It's like a city with an impenetrable wall around it. <coughs> no one's going to get in. That's what God is for us. He is our strength and he's our, uh, and nothing's going to come in. But then he goes on. Then he thinks about the past. Look what he just says in verse 2. This is past tense. It happened when the wicked came against me to eat my flesh. Well, that could be figuratively speaking to slandering you, all right? Slandering you, eating your flesh. My enemies and foes, what they do? They stumbled and fell. Many of you guys can look in your past and you can recall not only one time, not only two times, but several times when the Lord has intervened for you. And he has provided you the grace and sometimes the mercy none when you didn't get what you deserved. Amen? So if you can look back and say, God, you did that in the past. Look at that. Thank you, Lord. And now I can look to the future. What? Because I have faith to know that I have grace for the future. Because grace is unmerited. You cannot earn it. It's that crazy love you were talking about. Again, your mind is where? On the Lord. On the Lord. And he's not going to stumble. Now he says the situation, so if an ar army encamps around me, you know, like we're in this city, we see the army camping around us, he's not going to be afraid. He says, my heart shall not fear, and though a war should rise up against me, they start coming at me. What does he say? In this I will be confident. What's this? Going back to the first. I'm confident to know that God is my light and my salvation. Amen. Period. Amen. He's my fortress. He's my strength. That's who he is. Amen? Amen. 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 And because of that, I can, I can put my trust in him. Now look what he says. One thing have I desired of the Lord. I'm going to stop here. What is the one thing you want God to do for you? One thing have I desired the Lord. As soon as I said that, all kinds of ideas popped in your head. And you know, I think David could have said, one thing I have desired the Lord is get Saul off my back. You said I was going to be king, let's do it. Okay? But look what he says. One thing I have desired the Lord and that I will seek after. What is it? To dwell in the house of the Lord. To dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. I don't think David means he's going to get his bedroll or his, his, his bed and roll it into the tabernacle or the tent, probably the tabernacle at this time because it wasn't built then, and camped out there. I'm not talking about that. He's talking about the very presence of God. The presence of God. The presence of God. And dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. We as Christians, do uh, you want to put a little bookmark there? Turn in to Ephesians chapter 2. Dwell in his house of the Lord all the days of my life. Ephesians chapter 2. And let's pick it up at 4. The key verse is 6. When we were singing breathe, this is your daily bread, my friends. This is God himself speaking to you. 
But God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, they, he made us alive together with Christ. By grace you've been saved. Look what he did. And he raised us up together and made us to sit where? In the heavenly places in Christ. Where do we keep our heads? Do we keep our heads in the house of the Lord, in the heavenly places? It's past tense. That's where he's put us. That's where he's put us. Wow. Think about that. We are with Christ in God. That's why Paul exhorts us in Colossians. Set your heart and your minds where? With Christ in God in the heavenly places. In the heavenly places. Um, another thing, he, in Psalms 23, 6, you all know, the 23rd Psalms, how does it end? Does anybody know how it ends? I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. There he is again. He's our shepherd who shall not want. And he's going to dwell in the house of the Lord. And most of us think, well, that means I'm going to go home and be with him in heaven. No, you're dwelling in his house right now. Amen. Forever, it has no beginning or end. Yes. I can really get a little philosophical and said, now. you know, in the mind of God, he knew already that you were in Christ before you were born. Who are you? Think about who you are. Think about redeemed. Think about where you are. With Christ in God. Yeah. John 14, 23. Those of you who want to flip over there. 14, 23. This is from the words of Jesus himself. And this is something that he's told his disciples and it applies to us too. John 14, 23. Jesus answered and said to him, one of his disciples, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word. In other words, since you love me. That if, that if, my friends, can be translated since. You say you love him, well, then you're going to keep his word. Because you follow through and you obey the person you love. Yes. Right? Yes. So if you anyone loves me, he will keep my word. And my Father will love him. Here it comes. And we will come to him and what? Make our home with him. So whether you want to talk about being in the house of God or the house of God being in you via the Holy Spirit... I don't care how you see it, whether you see yourself in Christ or Christ is in you, it's the same thing. Amen. Who are you? The old is gone, behold, the new is come. This is who we are. And so David is saying, one thing I have desired, I've desired, and that will I seek after. He's going to go after it. What did Jesus say? Ask, seek, and knock. And that knocking at the door of his house is yours. And so you can go and you can seek and there he is. Now look what he says. Now why does he want to do that? Here comes in verse, he's going to tell why. He wants to do it. Why? To behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. To behold the beauty of the Lord, boys in the back row that are busy talking. To behold the beauty of the Lord. The beauty of His holiness. The beauty of His, of his power. The beauty of His grace. The beauty of who He is. This is why He wants to dwell within the presence of the Lord forever, now, and in eternity. Just to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his tabernacle, to talk to him, to have a dialogue with him. Yes. Many of you people have discovered the beauty of that personal relationship with the Lord. You see his face and you talk to him and he relates back to you either in the depths of your heart or through his word. Yes. Through his word. 
He talks and he communes with you. You're dwelling in his house when you do that. Amen. You're dwelling in his house. And that's what he wants. And then we're going to inquire. And then he says, watch what he says here. The end result. Why does he do this? For in the time of trouble, he shall hide me in his pavilion. In the secret place of his tabernacle, he shall hide me. Now we know, again, it's not a concrete building. We're talking about his presence. So how can David describe being the closest to God you can be? He does by saying he hides me in that secret place, that holy of holies. Remember the tabernacle had that special room where only the, the high priest went once a year and that's where God came and spoke. That was a special place. David's saying, that's where he's going to hide me. When my enemies come around, that's where he hides me. He hides me in that secret place. He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. You're there underneath it. So he says in the time of trouble, he's going to hide me in his pavilion, in that secret place of his tabernacle. He shall hide me. And then he shall set me high on a rock. And now, listen, look at what he says. And my head shall be lifted high above my enemies round about me. It's like he's up here and they're all down there. Amen. You know? This is a perspective he has. Yes. You guys have all kinds of enemies. People, yes. Your mind is being bombarded again and again with condemnation and, and all kinds of lies that you're going, you're chasing freight trains every which way, going after this idol, going after that. you got all kinds of enemies. And you're right down in the middle of it. Yes. you got to get your head up where you are in his place, Amen. and then you're up here, and they're down there. Amen. I'm up here, they're down there. They're smaller. They're not there in the correct proportion. Why? Because I'm dwelling in the secret place of the Most High with God Himself. Amen. Renewing of your mind. Renewing of your mind, people. Renewing of your mind. You don't just take a magic pill. You seek His face. You seek His face. You, as, as He said in Psalms 25, he, you lift up your soul to Him. Okay? All right, then he goes on to say, what does he say? His enemies are round about them. Therefore, I will offer a sacrifice of joy and praise and sing unto the Lord. I tell you what, people, the people who know what it means to sincerely praise God know what it means to be in the presence of God. Some of you guys think the presence of God is everybody getting together, singing your favorite song, and having those nice, warm, fuzzy feelings. <laughs> I'm talking about you and God like this. I'm talking about you and God like this on a personal level. You're going to dwell there. You're going to be in there. You're going to seek Him. You understand what it means to receive His grace and His mercy. And you want to see and you want more of it. Well, then you know what happens. Now, after He's up there, He starts looking around. And now He's going to... Get back to a little bit more into where he was. Now he's crying out, Hear, O Lord, when I cry my voice. Have mercy also upon me and answer me. You know, sometimes, my friends, listen carefully. Sometimes you can have your special place where you pray, and again and again and again, the Lord just seems to speak to you. And then you go back to that same place and the same situation, and it's like the prayers are bouncing off the ceiling. Hello, God, where are you? Can you feel, God, where are you? And when that happens, we start panicking. And we say, no, wait a minute, this man isn't. And then the enemy comes in and feeds you little lies. And boy, before you know, well, this ain't working. You get up and, and off you go. Well, look what he says here. He's going through this right here. He's saying, have mercy on me. And then he says this. He's talking. He says, now listen. He says, when you said, God, seek my face, that means to seek the, 
to look to you straight in the eye and allow you, allow you to give me your favor and give me your protection. That's what it means to have his face shining on you. You have his favor and you have his protection. He isn't feeling it, okay? So he's saying, God, listen, you told me to seek your face. And I said, and I, you know, I said, your face I will seek. Don't hide your face from me. Do not turn your servant away in anger. Right away, when God doesn't respond to you, you think, oh, I must have done something really bad. And then you start thinking about all the sins you maybe didn't confess. And, you know, we do that. Condemnation comes in, and that's what's happening with David. But David's reassuring himself with the word of God. He said, you said, seek your face. I'm seeking your face. And then look at verse 10, so tender. He says, when my father and my mother forsake me, then the Lord will take care of me. In other words, if I'm left an orphan, the Lord is going to adopt me. Amen. And I like, um, I hope I copy it. Isaiah 49, 15. This is God speaking. Can a woman forget her nursing child and not have compassion on the son of her womb? Here it comes. Listen carefully. God's speaking to you. Surely they may forget yet I will not forget you. I will not forget you. I will not forget you. So then David just says, teach me your ways and lead me, O God. He says he wants that. Verse 13, you know, I would have lost heart unless I had believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. He knows who he believes in. He knows the truth. My friends, you're going to lose heart if you don't know the truth. If you don't know the truth, you're going to lose heart because the, the, the battle intensifies. God arranges it that way. Why? To make you stronger. Remember I said in the middle of troubles, you're going to run to him. You're going to run to him. Why don't you do it when you're feeling good. Maybe he won't turn the heat up as much. <laughs> and then finally he says, wait on the Lord. Be of good courage and he shall strengthen your heart. I said, when I wait, I say on the Lord. I've done this before, but I want to remind you that the word wait in Hebrew actually means bind together. It means to perhaps by twisting. It's like entwining. And the best way I can illustrate is, this is God. My husband doesn't use this stuff, but I do. <laughs> this is God, and this is me. That's what it means to wait. It means to entwine yourself in God. It means to wrap yourself in God. And it goes right back to the very beginning. Focus in on who God is. Realize who you are positionally in Christ. Dwell in His house. Seek His face. And then you're going to be flying high spiritually like Pastor Walt. Amen. And when and, and speaking how God, and I'm close with this. Speaking how God speaks, uh, I always go through tr traumatic things before I. You guys don't know that, but a confirmation. When I came in here, the very first song, it said something like, "There is a place where I'm changed, where I belong. Take me to that place, that secret place where I can be with you, and you can make me like you. Wrap me in your arms." That's what it means to dwell in the house of the Lord forever, forever, forever. Corumdale, live every moment of every day before the face of God, under his authority, to his honor and glory. Mind and heart with Christ in God. Amen. It's a sure thing. Thank you, Father God, for your word. Your word is truth. I just pray, God, we hide in our hearts. And Lord, we just walk in your light so we can illuminate the, 
the darkness that continues to try to lie to us. Forgive us of our sins, God, and help us to be children of the light and know that we have a strong tower in you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.